Welcome to the Real Estate to Freedom podcast, the go-to place to gain financial freedom through real estate investing. Here we interview investors, mentors, and entrepreneurs who share their secrets and advice to help you build passive income. Let's get into the show. Today we're speaking to someone that I would tell his 17-year-old self to go ahead and skip school and go straight into real estate. But our guest, Josh Sterling, didn't know that back then. Instead, he pursued a degree in aeronautical science and got a job as a commercial airline pilot, eventually rising to captain. When the recession hit, his work hard was rewarded with a demotion and a pay cut. So he made the decision to get a side business so he can control his future and discovered real estate. So today, Josh pursues real estate full time, growing his portfolio to over 260 units and built out his own property management business to boot. On this episode, he walks us through his first deals in the single family space, how he bought his properties on his credit card, and how that struggle inspired him into multifamily. He also talks about building his relationships with a few good brokers, describing how he scaled his multifamily business. And he also explains his approach to multifamily syndication, sharing how multifamily allowed him to quit his day job and go to work on his own terms, spending time with his family, and really enjoying life. He also allows us to uh, take a look at how he applies his creative finance methods as well. So let's get Josh on and pick up some tricks and tactics to uh, building success in real estate. Hey, Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, appreciate the time here. So maybe you can give us a brief introduction about your background and, and how you got started. All right, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version here. I grew up out Lake Tahoe, California, went to uh, school to be an airline pilot, basically 17, 18 years old, graduated in high school, went through four years of school and did the airline pilot career thing for about five years. During that time, the economy was also in the midst of a, the big recession. And ended up realizing about halfway through that period that I wasn't making any money and I had no job stability and I had no control. So we started getting into uh, real estate, my wife and I, uh, with a single family house in Southeast Michigan and grew that into what's today or about 265 units in the portfolio and still growing. That's nice. That's, that's an amazing story. You know, and what, definitely want to dig into a little bit more about that. So maybe you could tell me, you know, what's, what, what is your primary motivation? I mean, obviously, as a pilot, you get a lot of attention. I would imagine you get pretty decent money of the lives of all those people and those big tubes of flying through the sky. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the thing for me that the initial motivation uh, going back to the 09 time from when we got into this was the, it, the pilot career, it seems great on paper and it is if everything goes well, but what nobody tells you about that, that industry specifically, but there's a lot of other, really any job, if you really boil it down, is that you don't have control, you don't have stability. So somebody else can make a decision, someone that you don't even know or have never met or seen, and that can greatly impact your life. In my case, it worked out to a, we got a 50% pay cut with about three weeks notice. Um, that was my big kick to uh, to do something different, you know, but it could be anything. Uh, companies go out of business. You could, you know, you could be downsized. You could be fired altogether. So just to have no control, I, I realized that uh, I didn't want to continue the rest of my life that way. Wow. Yeah, it's, that seems to be the case with, uh, well, pretty much how people are brainwashed into into doing that, that same sort of thing in, in a job, right? That's uh, Right. I, I never realized that there was another choice uh, until that you know, real low point when I didn't have much else to do. So, you know, my whole life I was taught to uh, go to college, get a good job, buy your own house to live in and retire when you're 65. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, now you mentioned you, you do a, you did some, uh, some single families, how you got started. Maybe you can tell us about your first deal. Yeah, sure. So my first ever single family was somewhat of a, I was a huge learning curve. I, I had no clue how much I didn't know, but I jumped in and did it anyways. We ended up buying a property in a little suburb. We're, we're, we're south of Detroit. So I like to always clarify that we're not in Detroit. Yeah. You know, clearly can be in some areas a war zone. There's also some really thriving areas now. But we're about uh, 20 minutes south of there in a suburb type area. Your typical house nowadays is going for 120-ish, 130. So in that at that time, I found a property for uh, $40,000 that was... I'd looked at several that weren't fixed up and I'd found one that was 
it looked looked to be fixed up, meaning it had new paint, new carpet, kind of a lipstick on a pig type of type of remodel. And so we had scraped um, all the money that I could gather with a little tax return money, a little bit of savings. And then we were using these 0% credit cards with balance transfers. So you could get the money. It worked out to with a fee, like a 3% type interest rate over a year. And then you had to pay it off. So it was extremely risky. Wow. Uh, but we scraped up this, you know, 40 grand or a little bit more than that to, to close this deal and thought we had basically a turnkey rental, which in theory we kind of did because we moved someone in right away. And the irony in the whole thing was there was uh, capital was obviously my biggest problem at the time. And there was a sign in the window that was like four feet by four feet that said for sale on land contract. And I told my wife, I go, that land contract, that sounds like a scam. I don't, I don't think we want to do that. So we used all of our cash to buy this and had to start over with the same 0% credit cards on the next deal going forward. And But but either way, you know, the, the funny thing is about that is, is it worked and it got us into it. And then we realized that we could buy houses a little bit cheaper, do the remodels ourselves, which I was physically doing them myself at first for the first few. And we could add that value on our own by, by doing that remodel and basically flipping the house to ourselves. Nice. So I, I bet now you're using all kinds of different creative financing methodologies at this point in your career. Uh, uh, you know, so we still buy single family as well. We'll we'll buy whatever works. I have a strong preference for multi, but uh, you know, the benefits of single family it creates these big capital events for us, meaning that we can buy several houses, you know, over a few month period, four, five, six, or sometimes as many as 15 and package them together on a, we call it a, a portfolio blanket loan. It's just a commercial loan that th- that a bank will hold on its own books. If you look up a por- portfolio lender, they're all over the place, any small bank. Um, we And we, like we said, flip those to ourselves in a way. So we keep those houses, pull out the equity that we've added by doing a nice remodel at a cost below market um, and are able to refinance refinance those properties at market rates at what has up until recently been appealing interest rates and then use that capital to reinvest. You really don't need much creative financing once you get a few going. You can essentially recycle the same, even in this market, four to $500,000. You That's all you really need. You can recycle that time and time again if you buy the right deals. Hmm. Interesting. So basically then when you after you purchase the, this package, you then pull the money out out of one of these these portfolio companies. Yeah, so I'll give you a quick, um, probably the simplest way to to, to discuss that is, uh, let's say that we buy a house for $80,000. The key is you have to do, let's say, at least three to four at a time. So we'll say four. So you buy a house for $80,000, we are going to put 20000 into it, let's say. So we're into it for one hundred k for rough numbers. That house is going to appraise at, let's say, one hundred and thirty k just like if you were flipping it, right? You would be able to turn around and sell that house for one hundred thirty. dollars now you're going to do that four times over. They don't you don't have to buy four houses on the same day or anything like that, but you're going to do that within a couple month period ideally, right? So all in you're going to be all into these for 400,000. If they all roughly appraise at let's say 130, they're going to appraise at 520,000 and if you do an 80% loan, I'm doing the math right now on it, you get 416. So you end up getting a little bit more than what you put into it back. I've done some where I've gotten a hundred grand more than I had into them. Um, I've done some where I've come closer to breaking even, but the key is to not tie up too much of your capital. And obviously they still need to cash flow the, what the banks call a debt service coverage ratio um, at a metric that allows you to have a cushion there because you pulled that value out. Right. Typically 1.25. And I imagine it's still the same right. for, for the least of the packages, yep. right? Exactly. We're, we're typically shooting. Now we typically shoot for 1.5 or better just to have a little bit more margin, but the banks usually require 1.25. Yeah. Wow. Very nice. Interesting. Now, as far as shifting to multifamily, it sounds like you're still playing in both fields, but when, when did you make that shift? And are you still doing you're still doing it today? Yeah, we do both. We've even, we even do new construction right now today. So we do a little bit of everything, whatever really works. And, and for me, it's all about keeping capital moving finding opportunities and not just being locked into one particular asset class. You know, like I said earlier, if I could do all multifamily 150 unit deals all day long, I would just do that. But as as everyone listening to this knows, the market's a little bit tight right now. And so we are making the most logical choices we can with what's available and only buying what makes sense. So for us, that shift, though, it happened um, a couple years into the single family side of things. We came across a 24 unit deal um, that was in in trouble. Um, It was initially about in the 60% occupancy range. And, and we'd wanted to grow. We'd, you know, I'd, I'd seen the light that multifamily was much more scalable. So we were, say, 24, 25 single families in, and we found this 24-unit deal. We were essentially going to double with the purchase here. 
it didn't work out. There was a lot of back and forth. The seller decided he wanted to keep it after we got it in negotiations and was trying to turn it around. And it actually fell apart for about another year, maybe year and a half. And then as a lot of these will, will do, we left the door open and, and that deal came back to us. And when it came back to us, it was in a lot worse shape. It was down to uh, the day we closed, it was 42% occupancy. So they they'd lost more, more occupancy. They were three years behind on taxes, which meant they were about to lose it for taxes. So they were in dire need to sell this property. And so we bought it before I probably even knew what the definition of a value add play was, but it was a textbook value add play. Um, and we bought it on land contract. We did that because no bank is going to finance, at least no bank that I know of, maybe you got some for me. Uh, no bank that I know of is going to finance a deal at 42% occupancy with a ton of deferred maintenance. Right. That's true. Wow. Nice. So, I'm gonna, And you still have that deal today, right? We still do. In fact, I've refied it twice since then. So I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me now, but we bought it, I know, for 514.9 day one. That was back in 2013, October of 13. We refied it 14 months later. We had it. I wouldn't say all the deferred maintenance was done, all the CapEx, but, but a, a good portion of it was. And we most importantly had it full, 100% occupancy, and um, and we had raised rent somewhat. And so we were able to refinance that, pay off that land contract, it ended up being a total of 14 months, which was which was much better than planned, and pull out essentially all of our capital or then some. I think we refinanced it. It appraised somewhere in the 900000 range. And we took a 75 or 80% loan to value loan on that. Wow. Nice. And then most recently, three months ago, I've been doing a lot of restructuring to uh, agency type financing, which I'd be happy to cover with you. But uh, but we're able to refinance that with an appraised value at one point three million and pull out a loan amount for one million even on it. Wow, very nice, very nice. So, so would you say that was probably your first syndication deal then, or were you doing syndication before that? Uh, that wasn't even a syndication. That was literally a our own capital into it. And the way I got that capital for that initial down payment was through those single family blanket loan refinances that I was doing. So I'd have ah. an equity tied up in single families and I'd pull it out with a portfolio refinance note. And then I use that capital to put the hundred and say 25,000 down I needed or whatever that down payment was on that land contract. Yes. Yes. Well, in that case, yeah, you get to keep all the returns. Yeah. I, to this day, I, that's still my uh, mindset. I, you know, I'll syndicate if, if it makes sense, but uh, if I have the capital sitting there, yeah, of course I'd rather keep it. Equity is expensive. If you give away all your equity, you know, you're going, you're giving away a lot of the deal. So we'll go, we'll go either way. My most recent deal that I bought a smaller 30 unit deal. I didn't syndicate that at all, but the one before that we syndicated. So it just depends on what we have available and also how strong the deal is. It needs to be really strong to syndicate. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Now, well, now that you've had time to obviously dedicate to the business and you've done it in a very big way, what are, what all are you doing to continue building your career in, as a real estate investor? Are you following like some sort of formula? Are you following a certain mantra or? Um, I wouldn't say it's a specific formula by any means, but now that it's full time, it's obviously much much easier to to look at deals, to analyze deals. I mean, this is our, you know, this is this is what we do every day. I also run a manage a property management company. So we manage our uh, portfolio, which is right now about 265 units, uh, single and multi, probably about 60% multi. And then we also manage another about 190, almost 200 units on top of that. So that operation now pretty much runs itself with the leadership team we have in place. But but that took a lot of work to get that up and off the ground. So my, my main focus is typically finding new deals, sometimes finding new money. I mean, in the last few months, we were doing a lot of the agency type refinancing and even refinancing some of the single family portfolio to try to take advantage of uh, what I think might be the last of some low rates for a while. That's, but that's most of our day to day. Yes. Nice. You know, now I want to take a step back because you just reminded me of something. Now that you're working on this full time. When did you make that shift to, to turning up this business as your primary gig? How did you make that transition from being a pilot to doing this? And what was, how did it feel to finally? break free of, uh, of the chains of, uh, of, of being an airline pilot. <laughs> All right. So ironically, had I just quit being a pilot right when I started buying real estate, I probably would have had an easier time getting into full-time real estate. But when I made that decision to start buying single families at the time and, and moving down this path, I also switched careers and uh, took a job as an air traffic controller. Sometime that same year, we started buying our first couple of properties. So that was a much better paying job. So I did that 
actually all the way up until May of 2016, which was way, way, way too long. I probably should have quit like in 2014. Um, I easily could have with the lifestyle we lived and the income we were making off the real estate portfolio at the time, but I was scared to give up such a good paying job. It was like a golden handcuff. So it just, it took me way too long to, to, to make that move. Yeah. I, and I think that's one of those jobs that once you quit, you can't go back in, I believe. That's it. Once you quit, you're done. And it's uh, it could be almost a $200,000 a year job. So I know there's people out here listening that have that golden handcuff you know, feeling. And, and it's true. It's, it's really hard to make that jump. So we started tracking personal expenses real closely uh, for, for a while. I mean, I, I debated this move for a good year and a half, two years before I did it. Tracked personal expenses. I knew exactly what we needed each month. And we even went for about the last year that I worked and put every penny that, that I or my wife uh, received in a paycheck into a separate account. We might use it to invest or whatever, but we specifically lived off a draw from the business for, for a good year and made sure that that was what gave me the confidence finally that it was okay to do it. I said, all right, I've been living off the business for, for a good year now. It should be fine. Oh, nice. Okay. So you, I understand now. So you basically took all your, your paychecks, put them on one separate place and almost like uh, did a mock scenario. Right. right. Nice. And for whatever reason, even though I could see it on paper clear as day, that was what gave me the confidence to say, well, we've been doing it now. So there's really no reason. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Oh, that's great. That's great. I love hearing those stories. But I think part of that, and maybe this is somewhat new, is the property management business. I know you touched on that earlier. How is it different from other ones? Like how, what, what makes you guys better than all the other property management companies that are out there? So we started and with our, our business is called Epic Property Management. We started Epic Property Management back in uh, sometime in 2013. And it was just managing our own por portfolio. We probably started about 50 units with, with the actual management company. And the way it started was because I realized that a, I had grown it too big that I couldn't handle, certainly with a full-time job. And B, I didn't want to self-manage everything because it was just another full-time job that a vacation was out of the question. So, you know, once I made that realization, my first instinct was to hand the portfolio over to a, another management company, which would be really nice. Um, what I found in my research was I didn't think anybody that I'd come across, at least in our market, could run things as well as what I thought we were doing, uh, or even efficiently enough to make it worthwhile. So we made the decision that we were going to start and, and build a management company on our own. And it started with literally one employee uh, and myself. I think it was even a part-time employee. And it grew. Now we're at 13 people in the office. We have a bunch of a fleet of company vehicles. Uh, we have a full-time operation going. And, and now we're about 450 units. Some of the things that made me want to launch that management company is I kept seeing these buildings uh, and houses, but specifically in multifamily. I'd see these buildings and they would be run into the ground, kind of like that first deal I talked about. My second deal was one that was higher higher occupancy, but had three to four hundred thousand dollars in deferred maintenance and capex. Um, and I'd see these buildings run this way, and I'm thinking, if I just buy this building and hand it over to property management, there's n good potential that I won't improve the building at all because there's there's something needs to change. So. One of the common things, for example, is especially in a, mul a small to mid-size multifamily property, I'll say 30 to 60 units, you you can't support on-site management. I think most people listening might might know that. it's it, The building's not big enough to have a leasing agent or an office person sitting there all day and certainly not big enough to have full-time maintenance. So what typically happens is you have a handyman that lives in one of the units and you have a resident manager who lives in one of the units. And... Uh, I know I'm being stereotypical here, but that resident manager is typically an old lady smoking a cigarette in her bathrobe, and she's the one representing your multi-million dollar asset, showing it to new tenants and and telling you what needs to be repaired and upkept and whatnot. And I couldn't see running our model that way. So what we do is um, everything is a mobile type operation, and it works well for single families and for these small to mid-sized multis. Um, we have a leasing agent in a company car um, that goes out for all showings, individual showings. We have maintenance staff and company trucks that go out for all maintenance repairs. Everyone's uniformed. We have project managers on staff, so if there are bigger issues, they can look at those issues and make a, a decision instead of just subcontracting it like you see a lot of companies do. They We have a leadership team, which is, I have a director of operations and an office manager, which run the day to day. And then we do things like little things like we're open seven days a week. We're open every day till 7 p.m. So really, really good hours after hours, live operators on the phone, just all these things that they're, they're small little details, but 
in, in the end, I believe it. We provide the nicest possible property. We have the most professional management, and we do it at a fair market rent. And you eliminate the biggest expense in real estate, which is turnover. That's right. Now, the, you know, the management makes all the difference in the world because there's so many managers out there. They even charge a premium, and they just don't deliver the same way that it sounds like the way you do it, which is great. And but it sounds like you're only focused on Michigan at this point. Right. So we're um, in the process of working on a satellite office. Now, the, the nice thing about our model is it works really well within a 45-minute radius. Beyond 45 minutes, we just can't do an efficient job, mainly because we can't get that leasing agent out there or we can't get a company in-house maintenance, which we can operate much cheaper than subcontracted maintenance. So. If we get outside of that radius, we can't do a good job for our portfolio or for our owners. But the model is very scalable. So um, right now we're working with a satellite office in that will expand our radius that will probably be sometime later this year. And then in the meantime, a lot of our marketing, a lot of deal flow that we're getting is all over the Midwest. And this model would scale right into a larger 100 plus unit deal that would support on-site management. You know, Our strategy would be to send our leadership team down train the on-site uh, leasing and office staff, train the maintenance staff to our procedures, to our software, everything we do, uh, basically train our operations manual and then check up every couple of weeks. Then maybe that can get to every month. But that we, I believe that's how we, we have the best chance of growing the portfolio, potentially nationwide, but certainly throughout the Midwest. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Wow. And I think it also gives you a leg up in the local market as well, because as a property manager, you have access to the property owners, you have access to brokers that may want to do business. Kind of like it also extends your ability to acquire more assets. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a little bit of deal flow we've seen out of it. Not as much on the multifamily side as I would like, but but I do know that we have the potential to turn around a play that's more of a value add type property. So I think it gives us more of a market to go into in our in any market that we have a base in. Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Now, now switching gears, talking about the whole multifamily business, how do you model your acquisitions? So like, do you rely on certain pieces of data? Do you look at uh, closer demographics? What do you do? So my general model is I, I like to buy off of existing current financials, meaning that um, I like to go in. Uh, first thing I like to get is, is a, an actual current rent roll, as recent as possible. And then I'll, I'll model off. Of, and I think this is different than, than some other guys do it. But uh, I will model my acquisition criteria off of prevailing cap rate for that area, but off of existing financials. So for example, in our market right now, the Southeast Michigan market, a lot of the, the suburb cities we're in, I'm looking for deals that are an eight cap or better off of current actuals. If I can find that, that deal has some potential, possibly. Um, so that, that's really my initial criteria to get me in the door. I know a lot of guys will model off an IRR. I'm not a fan of that because uh, an IRR, if you run those numbers, will typically spike in years two or three, which will usually be lead you to wanting to, to sell the property. And our model is a, a buy and hold forever with a refinance strategy on there. Uh, for both our, our purchases that we wholly own and for our um, and for our syndications. So for me, it's more of a buy off existing financials at at least the market cap rate, if not a little bit better. That's got to produce a return if we're going to syndicate it for our investors. That's going to be typically a, an 8% cash on cash, quarterly distributions, principal pay down. We're usually getting financing that'll give us 5 to 6% on that portion of it. And then the value add, you know, it's such a wild card, but we're usually looking for at least 1% to 1.5% a year that we can conservatively add value. Getting that overall investor return to that 16 to 18% range if we do syndicate that deal out. Nice. Nice. Excellent. Now, what resources do you use when you're talking on other podcasts or just talking at your regular groups? What resources do you use that make people just stop whatever it is they're doing and pick up a pen and start writing stuff down? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I can't say I have any specific resources or tricks. Um, you know, I, I, I run numbers. Um, based off of uh, a couple of analyzers I use, but a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll run numbers just off a of rent roll and an expense ratio. You know, ultimately, I think that's something that, that maybe gets surpassed a little bit, do a little bit of coaching as well. Um, and when, when we do that, the, you often will come across a deal that you see somebody is running it at 35% expenses. And what maybe they are. I, I'm not here to say that someone can't run a deal like that. But but I know from my experience that I'm going to run a deal at 50% expenses. I mean, I'm literally within you know a percent or two of that. It's everything we've ever done has tracked towards those numbers. So 
I'll go in and apply the, those multipliers to an existing net income. And it's pretty easy to analyze a deal if you can, if you know what the prevailing market cap rate is. Now, how do you see the rest of 2018 playing out for, for multifamily or even real estate in general? I mean, it's uh, right now, I think you already touched on it. You know, you're with cap rates getting compressed here and potential of interest rates going up. I mean, aside from that, what, what all do you see? Yeah, you know, I think that is probably the biggest factor. I certainly don't have a crystal ball. If I did, I would have bought a lot more in 09 and 2010 and whatnot. But I see uh, certainly interest rates going up. I mean, we're already seeing the effects right now, even on some recent transactions we've done. I, you know, I, I think interest rate, in fact, I think today the 10 year was the highest it's been since uh, 2013 or something like that. So I see interest rates coming up. That means money is going to be more expensive. That means cap rates are going to have to come up the way I see it. And so I, I think we'll actually see potentially a little bit better deal flow. And what I'm personally hoping for is that the rates coming up force some people to start selling and maybe trigger a little bit of a, uh, you know, push it more into a buyer's market than what we've been seeing the last two or three years. Yes. Yes. I mean, even some of the more recent transactions I've seen just been getting crazy. It's just sheer, sheer madness. It is. I, I I mean we rarely find deals. We're 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 the last two or three years we've been buying a, a deal every eight or nine months. I mean I, I think we're looking at probably two to three hundred deals to even get one that we're even looking at now. It's yeah, getting really yeah, yeah. now. Are you, you're expanding beyond just Michigan though? I think right. Yeah. So our deal, you know, our our, our main source of deal flow is really anywhere Midwest. So we'll go, we're looking as far West as St. Louis, far South as Louisville. If you picture you know, our home base here in Detroit or South of Detroit. And then, you know, we can't really get into much East coast stuff because you're not going to see the cap rates we need there. But I've looked at some stuff, even getting towards uh, Eastern Pennsylvania and upstate New York. Nice. Now in those sorts of cases, and I'm not sure if you, if you have this in place already, but management, like in those cases that it's not a state situation, how, how do you manage those units from where you're at? So our strategy here would be, first, the building has to be large enough to support on-site management. So we're not even looking at deals that are 50, 60, 70 units in any of those markets because I don't believe that we'd find somebody... That, I'm, now, I'm sure there are property managers out there that would be great, and I might be missing that opportunity. But for our model, it needs to be 100 plus units, um, ideally more like 140, 150, that will support on-site management. Then we would transition our team down there, get them trained, get that on-site management up and running, and then just do periodic follow-up. So we do have the benefit of having an airplane that we use for company business. Business. So uh, it makes those trips anywhere in the Midwest, you know, an hour or so, uh, hour and a half, and it's not too big of a deal. What advice do you have for aspiring real estate investors? It sounds like you've been on quite a journey. It sounds like a hell of a journey. Now, what advice would you have for someone that's that's uh, currently thinking about doing this, but they're just afraid to take that leap? What, what would you say? Well, and that's just it. You know, if you're just getting into this and and not sure if you're ready to take that leap, first things first, you've got to get educated. You've got to know what you're looking at, what you're talking about, what is a good deal, what's not. There's courses all over the place. There's a tons of free information, podcasts, books that you can read on this. So get educated, but don't get too educated. Don't take six, eight, 10 months and to get educated. It, you can do this in, in a couple months and then start looking at deals. Uh, if you know what a good deal is, then it's just a matter of jumping in and doing it. And that's probably the biggest hurdle is I see people all the time that have... I mean, the bar was set pretty low because I had no knowledge when I jumped in. But I see people that have a lot more knowledge than, than what I had then or maybe even than what I have now uh, that don't jump in because the analysis paralysis. So... Once, once you've got a base under you, it's a matter of looking at deals and going for it. And at the same time, knowing well enough what that good deal is that, let's say in this market, you're not chasing any deal that comes along. That's what it is. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So so what's exciting you right now? What, what do you have uh, that's uh, that's on on the table? It's just boiling over for, with excitement. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm excited. I'm excited about the growth of uh, of our management company, but probably most specifically, well, if you take out airplanes, airplanes are the most exciting <laughs> thing to me. Um, but uh, but grow acquiring those larger deals, uh, specifically outside the area. I I think once you prove a model, we've we've really proven this model in our, in our home market um, with mid sized mid sized properties. We've found ways to add a lot of value. With really, it comes down to management, and I think as soon as we can move that model to a little bit larger properties, starting with the Midwest, it, it could be scalable, uh, potentially nationwide, or certainly any type of cash flow market it, it will work well in. So I'm excited for some uh, 
some deals to start coming on the market with these rising interest rates and uh, getting able to being able to take some of those down. Excellent, excellent. Now, how can people reach you and your property management company? Sure. So uh, our management company we're based in Southgate, Michigan. Uh, our management company is called Epic Property Management. E P I C Epic. And uh, anybody can reach me directly, info, which is info at epicpropertymanagement.com, or you can check out our website, epicpropertymanagement.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. Really appreciate it, Josh. Thank you. It was a really nice time. Thanks again, Josh, for coming on the show. Working a full-time job while investing in real estate is not always easy, but as Josh proves, it's totally possible. He used tactics and systems to acquire his properties. There are many tidbits of info in this episode, and I'm sure you've been listening to this one again. If you want to reach out to Josh, you can get him at www.epicpropertymanagement.com. I also included his content info in the show notes. I hope this is helpful for you guys, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Real Estate to Freedom podcast. For more free podcasts, articles, videos, and resources, go to www.realestatetofreedom.com.